What are the common pitfalls to avoid in an object detection data set and how to spot them? A good data scientist is a good data janitor. Without a data set you have prepared with care and love, your machine learning model is a gigo system. Garbage in, garbage out. Your data is like your partner. You gotta spend time with them to understand them. Let's go with an example. We'll download a data set from Kaggle and see the common mistakes people make. We're going to look at this data set, Traffic Vehicles Object Detection, available on Kaggle. Now, before I start making remarks about this data set, I want to make it very clear that I'm very thankful to all the people who make data sets and code available to the public. It's, uh, we all have to be thankful for their contribution and this criticism that we are going to do in this video it should be seen as a constructive criti criticism. It is for other people to learn from the mistakes that were made in this data set. It is not a criticism of the person. And we are still very, very thankful that somebody took the time and effort to create this data set. With that out of the way, let's look at how do you go about analyzing the quality of a data set. So in this, the very first thing you do when you get an object detection data set is obviously to find what are the various classes in the data set. Here we can see that there are seven classes. It says car, number plate, blur number plate, two wheeler, auto, bus, and truck. Even if you knew the meanings of all these words, words are simply words. They are not the real data. So you have to dig in and see for yourself what do these words represent. Uh, Car probably is car number plate, blurred number plate. Two wheeler in this data set basically is uh, a bicycle or motorbike, etc. And auto is actually an auto rickshaw. So let's let's look at some of these classes. So here the data set consists of images, and inside images we have three directories: train, val, and test. Train is the one that people use for training. You can see that there are 738 files, which um, is actually a small data set, but um, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. And then we have the validation set, which is 180, uh, 185 files. The split between training and validation is about right. It is, you know, you could say 70, 20% split uh, or 80, 20% split. And we have an additional test set, which doesn't have um, uh, labels there. So there is also this labels directory where we have train and val. There are no labels for the test set, which is fine. Now, the very first thing you should do after getting a data set is look through some examples of the data set. And here you can go over a few examples. And very quickly, you will notice that it's a pain to go through one example at a time. First of all, you're not even looking at the annotation of this data and so it becomes very tedious to go and look at the data set this way so i always recommend that whenever possible whenever the data size is manageable in that case we should download all the data to our local machine uh, and when i say manageable uh, i mean less than 10,000. so if the number of images in your data set is less than 10,000, it makes total sense to download all the images on your local machine and view it one at a time, the whole data set, uh, go through it at least one time, if not more. And we'll see how it reveals a lot about the data set, just the act of going through the data set. So you can click download here and download all the data set. Next, we will go over the data set in my local machine. All right, so I have downloaded the data set and I'll go through them quickly. You can see that you know, downloading the data set uh, on your local machine, it helps you go through the data very quickly and you don't have any excuses. Even if you have a thousand uh, images, uh, it takes less than a second per image. You can go through them very quickly. So uh, the first thing you uh, see about the data set is uh, the notion of a truck. This is a truck in India and you can imagine this is another example of the truck. And this is very different from what trucks look like in the United States. So even though it says truck, you have to look at the data to understand what does truck mean, right? So there are several examples like this. Uh, so you should go through ev each and every example 
in your data set to see what they mean by different things, right? So it gives you a sense also about the statistics. It gives you an intuitive sense about the statistics of the image. You know, you know, there are some images which are really tiny in this data set, some are very large. So you're trying to become familiar with your data set. And this process, this step is very important. You also notice here that there are some examples in which uh, the author has used stock photos and they are watermarked. Uh, clearly, these examples are not meant to be here because people did not, you know, people who are selling stock photos, they do not want you to have these photos in your data sets. They want you to buy these things. And so we have to be respectful of uh, what they want and uh, remove these things from the data set. On the other hand, if you want your data to be uh, robust to this kind of watermarks, you can add your own watermarks later on. But it's a good practice to uh, just remove these kinds of photos in the beginning, just out of respect for people who have created these photos. So let's see, let's keep going. Uh, one other thing you will notice is that these examples here, many ex images are taken from the same video sequence. Uh, remember that there are only 700 or so images in the training set. And out of these, uh, let's say these 10 photos that I'm just showing, they came from a single video. So we have added a lot of bias towards this, uh, uh, this, this video sequence into our data set. Because ideally, if you have a small data set, we want to create a lot of variance in the data set, which means that we want to have a lot of variety in the data set, which is completely broken. Look at these two images in the training set. They are more or less the same. There is not a lot of variety in the data set. So that's not good. You know, we are oversampling from a, a few videos and you'll see other videos also uh, later on, like this one is again, a sequence from a video and there are several frames from the video and these are heavily correlated frames, which means that they are not adding a lot of information to our data set. So that's something to avoid. If we have a small data set, we want to maximize the variance of the data inside it, which means that we should not be uh, sampling so many frames from the same video. Otherwise, you're not getting that much information inside uh, the data set. Uh, we keep going, you know, it's very important to keep looking at this data and try to see what other flaws are there in this data. So here we saw a bunch of uh, images. We have already talked about this. Now in this uh, photo, you see something interesting. The author has included this image which is pretty dark. This is uh, a good example because we are trying to take care of illumination, etc. But if you are going for these hard examples, it is very crucial to understand that uh, this data set will not be enough. You need a lot more variance. Uh, you need a lot more data to capture these different kinds of uh, images. So the sample size, the size of the data set, 700 images, when you want to handle illumination, uh, here you also see that there is perspective change. Uh, the other image was taken from uh, an eye level camera. This is taken from an overhead camera looking down. So there is perspective difference, etc., uh, which means that the author is trying to do a lot with the data set. They are trying to get cars from many different angles, etc., which is great. But then the size of the data set is not enough to capture that variance. So if you are trying to solve a hard problem, you also have to make sure that the size of the data set is commensurate with the size of your problem. So that's one thing. Again, uh, we see this problem of having uh, multiple frames, many, many frames from the same. Uh, look at this. There is so little information change between these two frames that it's, it's redundant almost, right? So uh, the, the data set is not as big as it sounds. Even at 700, it is effectively, we can say it is about 300, 400 uh, images. Okay, so let's keep going. So these are the different kinds of trucks uh, that you see in India. Uh, this is also not an anomaly, just in case people are thinking, you do see such scenes in uh, suburban uh, rural India 
you see trucks carrying these kinds of uh, loads and this is another kind of truck so you do see that the trucks are very different in India uh, great examples great examples so you do see a lot of variety in the trucks oh here I don't know that's a that's a very funny <laughs> um, loading of the truck uh, it's almost obscene but let's move on it's still a valid data so uh, it gives us a sense of uh, what these data set is and then there is another class in the data set called uh, auto which is for auto rickshaw so these uh, things which are also called tuk-tuks in Thailand I think or East Asia they are uh, called auto rickshaws in India and you can see examples of those two wheelers they have used these scooters motorbikes as well as uh, bicycles as two wheelers anything that has two wheels uh, in a bit we will see how the two wheelers are also defined how the data has been defined for the two wheeler uh, i'll come to it in a little bit so you get a general sense of all this data right so you should look at all the images of the training set uh, i'll <laughs> another funny um funny somebody carrying a water cooler uh, on the back of uh, a two-wheeler you see these scenes in india pretty often so uh, these are standard th this can be part of a standard data set okay now one other thing you have to realize it's not sufficient to just look at the uh, training set you also have to look at the validation set so when you go through this validation set looks looks good looks good you know we have the same problem of uh, of uh, watermarks um, and now we start seeing that the same videos which were used in the training set some images from those videos have been used in the validation set as well remember that the training set should be different than the validation set but if you use frames from the same video in the training set uh, and the validation set then you are basically encouraging the model to memorize it will show uh, accuracy on the validation set to be higher than it actually is i'll show you an example let's pick this image and let's pick the one image if you look at 129 in the training set right here uh, right here now i will put them together you can see that these two images one was in the training set and the other was in the validation set they are so close to one another that it doesn't uh, make sense it's not a good idea to have these two things so close uh, together one in the training set and one in the validation set what would happen is that the model would appear to perform very well on this validation set uh, but it is only because of the fact that you had a very similar image in the training set so uh, you will get a very false sense of accuracy if you use this data set so be very careful not to use frames from the same video which you used in the training set uh, in the validation set keep them completely separate similarly if you are uh, working with say chest x-ray uh, data and uh, you have a subject so you should not use the same subjects chest x-rays in the training set and also in the validation set so separate the two things by subject so if you're using uh, a subjects x-rays in the training set then keep all the images for that subject in the training set and do not pollute the validation set with the same subjects um, uh, uh, data so something to be very very careful about otherwise you will come up with some examples which look stunning you know the results look very good but when you take them in real life you will see that they don't generalize the model has simply memorized your uh, results on the training set and because the validation set was sampled from the same kind of data it performs very well there but uh, that's a fake uh, accuracy that you're looking at all right so now you have gone through all your data manually each one of them and after that the best thing to do is to write some code to get the statistics of the data 
you may actually get the statistics of the data from uh, the source that you downloaded it from. But why take a chance? You know, data is something that you have to spend time with. So you write your own script to get the statistics about the data. So here, for example, I have written a small script that goes into the training set and the validation set, reads the information and generates some statistics about the data. So when I run this thing, it gives me this information. It says that in the training set that there are 738 images. Great, that uh, information was right from the website also. The number of cars is 4,116. The number of number plates, 479. Blurred number plates, 1,149, and so on and so forth. Now, here's something very interesting. The number of cars in the data set is 4,000 roughly. And the, the number of buses in the data set is, 3, 000, is only 305. So there is a class imbalance problem. We ideally, we want all the classes that we are trying to um, identify in an object detector, we would like to balance them. It should be the same number, uh, ideally, you know, 10% here and there is fine, 20% is also fine. But this is very different. It is more than 10x. Uh, so that's a big cause of concern. You, we should not use this data set directly uh, because there is a huge class imbalance problem. So that's something, you know, you suddenly realize that, okay, uh, we'll need to do something about it, but it's not the end of the world. When you have class imbalance, there are ways to tackle the problem. You can gather more data that you can change uh, the loss function to take this into account, etc. But it is important to know that you have a problem. If you did not spend this time to analyze your data, you would not even know that you had a problem. Once you have uh, looked at the gross statistics of your data set, it is now time to look at the actual data, at the actual bounding box data that uh, is supplied with the data set. Now, the question is how many should you see? And my answer is for small data sets, which are less than 10,000, go through each and every one of them and check the quality of your annotation because most probably these annotations are done by either one human sometimes or even when it is done by more than one humans you have to make sure that they have done it consistently so most likely your data will be very very noisy no matter what you do no matter where you get this data from no matter how authoritative your source is it will contain a lot of noise and you have to remove that noise before you can do any modeling on top of it. So a lot of people don't even bother with this. I am shocked how many people just get the data set, start their training immediately and not even bother to look at what are you training on. It could be a gigo system, garbage in, garbage out. We don't want that. So we are going to, so I wrote some code here and basically, um, I'm going to draw bounding boxes that are in the data set. Uh, this also makes sure that I understand the data format correctly, right? This is YOLO v5 data format, which is very standard, but I also want to make sure that I completely understand how this bounding boxes are presented. There are a few different ways of representing the bounding box. I want to make sure that I understand it completely. So writing my own code, and this is like literally 50 lines of code, uh, maybe 80 lines of code, but it's not a lot of code. It helps you uh, understand what data you have. So write the code to read the annotation files and display the data uh, or the annotations on your files. And this is, you know, very simple. Here I have color coded the classes. For example, we have the red color for the class car. Uh, for number plate, I have uh, green and so on and so forth. Uh, so the reason I'm color coding it is because actually displaying the annotation in the image itself, it takes up a lot of space and it is going to clutter the entire image. So if I just remember the color codes, that is much more easy for me to go through the data and it doesn't clutter the whole space. And yeah, so now we are ready to do this um, and I'll just show the results. 
of how these annotations look. I've created another directory where I'm storing all these uh, annota annotations. And it has this directory, which is called uh, viz for visualization. It has the exact same structure. And I have simply uh, gone and added all the uh, annotation bounding box. So yellow here is for buses, blue is for uh, blood bounding box, etc. So here bus, 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 truck, uh, truck is orange. So this all looks good. Uh, it's looking good. Um, but you would be surprised that occasionally there are mistakes. For example, here, I quickly found out yellow was for a bus, but here suddenly there is a mistake in the data set and I didn't make it up. It is there in the data set. These two buses have been wrongly labeled as, uh, as, as cars, car is red. Now you see that this is the 10th image in the data set or maybe 15th image, who knows. But very quickly, you are able to see there is a mistake in the data set. And the reason is that we are all humans. Uh, while labeling, some mistake was made, right? Uh, but we also have to verify. You know, uh, Ronald Reagan said that trust but verify. We always have to verify what data is being fed into our model. So here, uh, we discovered one problem. So that's one problem that the labeling could be incorrect. You could have a different class. That's one kind of problem. The other kind of problem could be, um, let's let's keep looking here. Now I'm literally into the 15th or maybe 20th image, and you can see that there is a missing label. So this uh, bus was not labeled. And you may think that, oh, missing label is fine. We just, you know, it is just going to ignore that image. The thing is that, uh, the, the answer is that that's not true. What happens with missing label is that this entire image is considered the null class or the background class. So it will take uh, the object detector like YOLO5 would take uh, this image, take samples from this image, different sizes, etc., and say that this is not one of the classes. So this bus could be in the negative class, which means that your accuracy will suffer greatly, right? So this bus doesn't have uh, any annotation. Very important to, again, another image where there is no annotation. And this is not no, this is not a problem in my coding. It is actually not marked. So you keep going. Um, we will quickly see uh, another problem with uh, inconsistent annotation. So let's keep going. So for here, for example, another class was missed. You can see that there was um, a number plate. And when we go to the next one, either this should be a blurred number plate or a number plate. It is still visible, but it was completely missed. So that's, uh, that's another problem that you need to fix in the data set. You can see that this number plate here has been marked as blurred number plate, but this one, they are missing it. So that's, uh, you know, missing data is a very common problem and you should go and fix each one of them. Otherwise that piece will become part of the negative set and your accuracy will suffer. The other uh, issue is here in this example, they have also missed another uh, motorbike, the two wheeler. Um, I mean, there are other two wheelers that they have marked, but this two wheeler has been missed. Similarly, there is a bus, I think right here, which is missed. There's a car right here that is missed. So uh, there is a lot of missing data here and that makes the data set uh, really not very good. We have to fix this data set before we can use it for, uh, for any uh, real world application. Uh, so we keep going. You know, having this kind of interface where you can quickly go through the data makes it really easy to uh, analyze things. One other thing you may have missed uh, right now is that when, when they are annotating the two-wheeler, it is always with the person. So let's go and see some examples of two-wheelers. Oh. So here, whenever they are annotating uh, a two-wheeler, they are annotating the two-wheeler with the person. And 
you know, that's perfectly fine to do, but we need to understand what is being annotated. That's why it is so important because it, uh, an alternative annotation would be that you only annotate the part of the two, two wheeler and not the person. Here they are annotating the two wheeler with the person on, on it. So we need to understand that, you know, uh, later on we can do some post-processing uh, if we just need the two wheeler or we can change the data, do whatever. But uh, at the very least, we have to understand what this data is. The two wheeler is not just the two wheeler. It is the two wheeler plus the person. So you see how just going through this data, you have learned so much about your data uh, that uh, was not obvious in the very beginning. And we'll see, we'll see more of this. Here again, um, the annotation was missed. So again, in this video data, you will uh, notice that this person, the, the two wheeler, it has been mislabeled. In this one, it is a two wheeler. And right here in this example, you can see that it has been mislabeled. This kind of mislabeling is very common in publicly available data sets. So you have to go and fix them. So using these color codes, etc., make a big difference when uh, and going through them quickly uh, makes a big difference. Uh, and now you can see again here, a mistake has been made. These are two wheelers right here, these three. But in the next frame, you can see that they have been labeled as, um, I think blue is for number plates. So uh, blurred number plates are blue and they have been labeled as uh, blurred number plates. And this is human error. You have to go through your data set to recognize all of these errors and fix them uh, meticulously. Similarly, we have missed one, um, missed the two-wheeler two here. And lastly, I want to go over the last kind of mistakes uh, very common in data set, which is inconsistent labeling. This is the one that is very easy to miss. Uh, and But this is very important. Now, in this example, you can see that the labeling has been done where even when you see a very small part of this auto, auto rickshaw, uh, it has been labeled. Similarly, in this example, a small part of the auto rickshaw is visible and it has been labeled. The same thing over here, a small part of the car is visible and it has been labeled. Now there is no fixed guideline, you know, how much of the object should be visible to make, uh, you know, to, to be called an object. But whatever you do, you have to do it consistently. And usually uh, in our practice, we just say that if 50% of the object is visible, then we will, we are going to, uh, we are going to mark it. But the problematic case is that you do it inconsistently. So in some cases you do it uh, and some cases you don't. And that is problematic. You stick to one definition of what kind of labeling you're going to do or what kind of annotation you're going to do and just stick to it. For example, in this case, uh, we just saw that even partial auto rickshaws were marked as auto rickshaws and cars. And here in this case, there is a partial car visible right here, but it is not marked. Similarly, you can see that this whole uh, car has not been marked. And here's another example. The truck is partially visible and it has not been marked. Another car here is uh, partially visible, but it has not been marked. Now, whatever you choose, you know, there is no uh, right answer or wrong answer. I personally think that 50%, if you can see 50% of the object, then it is uh, good enough to be labeled as the object. But whatever you choose, you have to be consistent. You cannot have inconsistencies in the data set like this. Otherwise, your accuracy will suffer. Let's summarize what we have learned. You have to spend time with your data. You will spend days training your model. It makes perfect sense to spend a few hours looking at your data. When possible, download the data set to your local machine and carefully look at every single image in the data set. The label may mean something very different from what you have in mind in object detection data sets, so check the data visually. 
Look for biases like many frames from a few videos in small data sets can be catastrophic. Check carefully if the training and validation sets are highly correlated. Do not put frames from the same video in both training and validation sets as a rule of thumb. Next, check the statistics of your data set to answer the following questions. How many images are in the training and validation sets? Is the data set sufficiently large for the complexity of the problem you're trying to solve? How many examples do we have in every class? Do we have a class imbalance problem? Next, look at the annotations for every image. Use visualization techniques like color-coded bounding boxes to quickly see the mistakes in annotation. Look for missed objects, misclassified objects, and inconsistent labeling. Remember, a good data scientist is a good data janitor. Spend time with your data, understand it, and then fix it. For a vast majority of problems, there is nothing more important than the quality of your data. This is Satya Malik signing off, your guide to the fascinating world of computer vision and AI. Thank you.